G'day, I'm Barney, and this is my real-time height map shadow shader. The basic idea of this project is to take a height map, which is a 2D image whose pixels represent the height of some terrain, and use only that information to generate 3D shadows, which can be computed in real time. If you want a more in-depth rundown on how it all works, I'd highly encourage you to check out the previous two videos in this series, because everything in this video builds on what I showed in them. All right, let's run through the changes I've made. If you recall from the last video, despite my best efforts, there were still some strange speckles occurring on the terrain near the edges of the shadows. I tried to fix this issue by implementing a janky bilinear interpolation when sampling the height map to try and smooth out the terrain, which helped but didn't completely fix the issue. As a lot of you pointed out, bilinear interpolation is something that GPUs can do out of the box, but after a lot of digging through source code and trying things out, I couldn't get P5.js to set the texture sampling mode to bilinear, so unfortunately, my homemade version is here to stay for the moment. Thankfully, there was another solution, which was to change the way the height map data is being stored to give it a lot higher fidelity. And this was suggested to me on my Discord server by the creator of the original post that inspired this whole thing, which is really cool. I've left a link to that post in the description, which you should definitely check out. The height maps I'd been using till this point were in grayscale, meaning that the same height value is being stored in the red, green, and blue channels, and the alpha was just always maxed out. As you can tell, this is a pretty big waste of the available data. A color channel in the height map is one byte of data, so each channel can only store 256 values. But if we were to use all four available channels, suddenly that number blows out to over 4 billion, which, as you can imagine, has a massive impact on the quality of the height data. I have absolutely no doubt there's a better way of doing this, but since GPUs work in floats from 0 to 1 for color channel values instead of ints, I couldn't think of a nice way of using bit shifting to cleanly pack and unpack the height value into the four channels. So instead, what I've done is to simply multiply the height value which goes between 0 and 1 by 4 and split them up between the channels to pack the values. And to unpack, I just add up the four channels together and divide by 4, returning the value to a range of 0 to 1. I don't think this is the most elegant solution, but it works. And as you can see, doing this little side quest, the visual artifacts from earlier have been completely eradicated. The height maps have also unlocked disco mode too, which is cool. Ironically, after all that, the next thing that helped the look a lot was adding some noise back in. Since the colors of the terrain are determined by the height, you get these big bands of color changes. A really simple fix for this is to just add a bit of random variation to the height value when we're determining the color of a pixel which nicely breaks up the color banding. Simple, but effective. A common request on the previous video was to blur the shadows the further the ray has traveled before detecting a hit. I started going down this path, but it quickly became pretty convoluted. To do it properly, I would have to run the ray casting shader and output a shadow map, basically just an image telling me if a pixel is in shadow or not, and a depth map, which tells me how far the ray traveled for each pixel. I'd then have to create another shader that's essentially doing a depth of field effect, blurring the shadow map based on the ray travel distance. It's definitely doable, but it would require a pretty major rework of the code I've currently got, and I'm not entirely sure that P5.js is the right tool for this sort of job anyway, but more on that at the end. What I've decided to do instead was a very simple solution, and that's to make the shadows weaker when the ray has traveled further. This is obviously a downgrade from the real blurring effect, but it's a really cheap proxy and it still softens the shadows in a way that I think is aesthetically pleasing. If you'd like to improve your coding skills, then check out today's sponsor, CodeCrafters.io. CodeCrafters offers a bunch of code-it-yourself challenges that let you get hands-on experience by recreating projects such as Git, Docker, and BitTorrent, just to name a few. The challenges are available in a variety of languages at different skill levels, meaning that CodeCrafters is perfect whether you're honing your skills in a language you already know well, or if you're wanting to try a new language for the first time. My favorite part is that you don't have to mess around with any crappy online code editors, you can simply use your preferred local dev environment. Just push your code to Git and CodeCrafters will automatically check if you've passed the stage. If you get stuck at any point, there are a lot of helpful pointers in the detailed instructions, interactive tutorials to explain topics, as well as hints, code snippets, and even screencasts from community members who have completed the stage to help you through. Try CodeCrafters for free with the link in the description and get 40% off if you decide to upgrade to the full experience. And thank you to CodeCrafters for being the first ever channel sponsor. 
Previously, the lighting model was very simplistic. I just had a darkened version of the terrain color that I would mix to based on how in shadow a pixel was. The in shadow value was just a combination of the raycast shadows and the self shadowing caused by the terrain normals. Since the raycast shadows were given a binary value of 0 or 1, the normal shadows were invisible wherever the raycast ones fell, making the dark regions look really flat. Softening the shadows the further the ray has travelled helps with this, since it lets the normal shadows contribute more to the overall shadow, but I've also now got some parameters that control the contribution from each different shadow type. To go along with this, I've also got a more traditional lighting model. If you want to learn more on the nitty gritty, there's a link in the description, but basically the colour at any given point is figured out by multiplying the terrain colour with the lighting colour. The colour of the light is a combination of the ambient light and the directional light, both of which have a colour and intensity associated with them. In this case, the directional light is the sun and its intensity is just the inverse of how in shadow a pixel is. Where this gets cool, and a lot of people ask for this, is that we can change the colour of the sun based on its angle in the sky so that when it gets low, we get nice red sunsets, but still get bright midday sun. And for the ambient light, I've just made it the same colour as the sun colour for now, and I drop its intensity based on where the sun is in the sky so that the sky gets overall darker as we get towards sunset. Another part of the traditional lighting model is specular highlights, basically adding shininess. This works by checking if reflections from the light on the surface, based on the normal, would hit the camera, and if they do, we make the light brighter, giving that surface a highlight. This obviously looks really strange when applied to the terrain, but the water should reflect the sun so we can mask the value based on whether we're rendering water or not. It also doesn't make sense for there to be reflections in the area of water that's inside a shadow, so we can mask them based on that as well. The specular highlights were pretty easy to see on the terrain, but since the ocean is just a flat plane, it's kind of hard to see the highlights, but we can fix that. We've currently just got a parameter that tells us the height of the water, but we can offset this with some noise. To keep it simple, I've got a Voronoi noise texture, there's a link in the description to where I got it, which I can pass into the shader and sample to give the water some waves. To make it a bit more interesting, I'm sampling the texture twice, rotating the texture in between, and also moving them over time, which gives a really nice choppy ocean effect. The new waves make the specular highlights a lot more visible, or should I say the specular highlights make the waves look a lot more visible, because without them, the waves barely make a difference. While we're having a look at the water, there were a few people that had suggestions on how to fix this too, and they make a massive difference. The main improvement is to have a deep and shallow colour for the water, and the colour quickly drops to the deep colour as the depth of the water increases. And I'm using an easing function to achieve this quick transition. The other fixes were some minor tweaks to colours and the waves from last time, and with these fixes, the water looks way better than before. And that brings us up to date, this is the current iteration of the project. There hasn't been heaps of progress despite the amount of time since the last update, and that's because this isn't my main project. Not only do I work full time, but I'm currently also working on a game called Star Mining Co, and I put out devlogs here on YouTube. If you think it looks cool, head over to the Steam link in the description and you can wishlist the game so you get notified when it comes out. Back to this project though, I've again been completely blown away by the amount of interest in it and I'm really excited to pursue it properly when Star Mining Co. is completed. My question to you is, if this demo was turned into a game, what would you want that game to be about? My initial idea is, since the water level is so easy to change, I could make the game about converting the island from fossil fuel based energy to renewables before the water level rises too much, but you've also got to balance the electricity demand to make sure people on the island have enough power. I'm not sure if that idea is too bleak though, so maybe a little cozy fishing village would be more appropriate. Either way, please let me know your thoughts in the comments. And in terms of what I said earlier, I don't think P5.js is the right tool for the job to take this demo to a full game. P5 is really great for little projects and prototyping, but I think I might use the project to finally learn the Godot engine. The first job will be porting everything over, which should be a fun start. But after making Star Mining Co. from scratch, I'm keen to experience game dev with an actual engine. All right, that's enough rambling for now. Thanks again for all the support, and I hope to see you again soon.